Scripture today comes from the Old Testament. <clears throat> it is the book of Habakkuk, found on page 871. <clears throat> Let us listen for God's word. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord God, open my mouth that I may proclaim your praise. Silence in us any voice but your voice, so that in hearing we may be obedient to your will. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Before we take on this very challenging text from the book of Habakkuk, it behooves us to take note that last Friday was All Saints Day. We in the Presbyterian Church don't limit saints to especially pious preachers or extremely trusty trustees, but just as our opening liturgy proclaims, we welcome all to sainthood. Listed in the bulletin today are some of the saints of this church who died over the last year. And what made them saints were not the miracles they performed, but rather what Martin Luther King Jr. said is the content of their character. The people listed here in the bulletin were really good people. Joyce Kachina had the hardest name to pronounce of all of them, but she also had the biggest smile. And Carl Dickerscheid never met a dessert he didn't like, but he also never met a person he didn't like, or a widget in the church that he couldn't fix. And then you see down on the list, Melba Clapsaddle. She's a saint just because of her name. Melba, what a great first name. And Clapsaddle, tremendous last name. Put them together, Melba Clapsaddle, and you've got yourself a name that deserves bright lights. Appearing tonight on the big stage, Melba Clapsaddle. I'd buy a ticket to that show just because of her name. Now, I could go on describing why each person in the bulletin is a saint, but suffice it to say, it doesn't have anything to do with their knowledge of the Bible or their church attendance or how much they complimented the preacher, although that helps. No, they are saints simply because they live a good and decent life and they understood the value of love. That's all it takes to be a saint. And so there's no doubt all of you are well on your way. Of course, if you want to be on the fast track to sainthood, then you compliment the preacher. 
So we are all saints in training. And our classroom is this sanctuary. And our curriculum is the Bible. And our homework is how we treat others. But until that distant future, when we die and receive our masters of sainthood, all we can do is wait. We are all saints in training who wait for the Lord. And that circles us back to Habakkuk. No one knows much about Habakkuk. Whatever history he experienced is lost. And whatever details of his life that made him a saint in training have been blown away in the wind. The only thing we really know about him is what is written in this three-chapter prophecy, and most of that is pretty obscure. One thing we can easily deduce is that he lived in troubled times. He writes in chapter 1, Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. Whatever time period this prophet lived, his life was under siege. Habakkuk was able to put into words the emptiness and despair that he was experiencing. He carried an authentic pain brought on by the decaying goodness around him. Think of slavery at its worst, or the concentration camps of the Nazis. Think of school shootings or out-of-control wildfires. Think of KKK lynchings. It doesn't take much for us to conjure up the depth of Habakkuk's tortured life. He lays it all out before us, saying, the wicked surround the righteousness. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. In other words, during this time period of his life, evil was winning. Now, none of us want to believe that evil is winning, right? Our faith has been saturated with too many sermons about hope for us to give in too easily to evil. But let's face it, in these days, evil seems to have a two-touchdown lead. There's a young man named Chuki who has built houses with us in Mexico each year for 15, 18 years. Chuki's always worked hard on the building site, but he's also had a mischievous cheat streak about him. He would play pranks on us and tease us and tell us that the walls that we just built were crooked, which was usually true. Just about a year ago, Chuki was made a foreman, and with that came a pay raise, and then he had a baby, and everything was looking good for Chuki and his family. But just last week, we heard that his house burned down. We're not talking about a nice little bungalow on Audubon. We're talking about a concrete block house with no inside bathroom, just a few light bulbs hanging from the ceiling. It burned down. For Chuki, like Habakkuk, destruction and violence are before him. Strife and contention arise. For a saint in training like him, it had to be devastating. He already lived in poverty. Now he lives in a burned-out heap of rubble. And we ask ourselves, O oh Lord, how long shall we cry for help and you will not listen? Surely that is Chuki's cry today, just as it was Habakkuk's cry 3,000 years ago. So this is about time in the sermon when I would usually make an inspiring transition from despair into hope. It would be great to be able to tell a rags-to-riches story here where evil's two-touchdown lead was 
devastated by a winning touchdown or two. And then Adam Vinatieri would kick a 52-yard field goal with three seconds left to win the game. And yes, occasionally that does happen. Once in a while, goodness kicks the butt of evil. And righteousness prevails. And then we all go home singing, lift high the cross. But just as often, evil lingers like a gloomy day. And suffering settles into a routine. And we don't sing any victory songs. And then all we can do is wait. That was Habakkuk's plan, to wait. In chapter 2, Habakkuk calls out to God saying, I don't know about your plan, God, but here's mine. I'm going to stand right here at my station and keep watch. And then a voice inside of him told him that was a pretty good plan. Yes, Habakkuk, you've got a vision of goodness so now trust in that vision, trust in the goodness, trust in God, have patience, wait for it. Wait for it. That was God's answer. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And Habakkuk seems satisfied with that answer. But is that an answer you can live with? Because waiting is not very satisfying behavior. Patience may be a virtue, but it is also very elusive. In Hamilton, the musical, one of my favorite songs is called Wait For It. It's sung by the character Aaron Burr. Burr is Alexander Hamilton's nemesis, and here's a spoiler alert, Burr eventually kills Hamilton in a duel. But when he sings, wait for it, Aaron Burr is trying to understand his course in life. You see, he's in love with a married woman, a woman who's married to a British officer. And he can't quite live up to the legacy of his parents. And then there is Hamilton, who always seems to be a step ahead of him. So in the song, he sings, And if there's a reason I'm still alive when everyone who loves me has died, I'm willing to wait for it. For him, this willingness to wait was enough motivation to keep his hope alive. He waits, and he watches, and he wonders. Same is true for us, except we're not waiting for Hamilton to make a mistake. We're waiting for God's goodness to show up and make the world better. We're waiting for justice to take a two-touchdown lead over evil. We're waiting for destruction and violence and contention and strife to surrender to God's love. And so we wait and we watch and we wonder. And if there's a reason we're still alive when so many have died, we must be willing to wait for it. So many around us have died. So many people have waited and watched and wondered. So many did not give up. And those are the people we call saints. The saints of God do not give up. They wait. And while they wait, they do whatever it takes to make the world a better place. There's a great story about two brothers who lived in a small town. 
And those brothers cheated and stole from everyone in that town. One of the brothers died, and the other went to the preacher and said, I'll give the church a million dollars if you will do my brother's funeral and call him a saint. Well, the preacher thought deeply about this because those brothers were just plain evil. But the church needed the money, and so the preacher said he would do it. The funeral came, and the preacher began, As you all know, he said to the people, the departed was an awful individual who robbed, cheated, swindled, and stole from everyone that he did business with in our town. However, compared to his brother right here, he was a saint. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Waiting for goodness to overcome evil may seem like a useless endeavor. It may seem that God has left us high and dry without any hope. But really, the time of waiting can be a full time, very productive time, because we are all saints in training, utilizing our faith to serve God and serve others. God's kingdom of goodness will come. But in the meantime, let's wait for it with our heads held high. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen.